Well, hey everybody, Research here. We've got another intermission video here. This is Victoria 2. Uh, this is a grand strategy game by Paradox. Let's you take pretty much any country that existed in the world between 1836 and... I don't recall what the cutoff is. 1920 or 30 or something like that. And, uh, and just freely manipulate history. It's, it's really a, a heck of a lot of fun. You've always been able to play as the United States in this game, and there have been events that trigger the Civil War, but one of the, if you take a look over here, uh, one of the expansions that came out was called A House Divided, and it added a bunch of American Civil War-specific models and music and events and all sorts of things, so it made it just a little bit, uh, a little bit more uh, in-depth. Uh, so... That's what we're going to take a look at right here. I'll warn you right now, I like Victoria. I like this game a lot. I am not good at this game. Though in my defense, playing a successful Confederate States of America game is very, very difficult. This mostly involves buckling down and trying to defend yourself while trying to influence other countries to get involved and uh, and get the United, uh, get the uh, UK to come and fight your battle for you. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna we're gonna try this out. We're gonna play CSA, and I'm gonna talk about some more things for you here since the Gettysburg video seems to have done pretty well. So first off, let's get this thing going. I didn't really talk about uh, uh, Ultimate General Gettysburg. Uh, I just didn't think there was very much to talk about. It's a very simple game. It's like playing a watercolor painting. It's just, it's so, it's so cinematic and pretty. But you saw effectively the entirety of the game. You're just dragging units around and trying to respond to various threats. Uh, Victoria is at the complete opposite end of that spectrum. This is a crushingly complicated game. And I appreciate that. Uh, but I do, uh, I do struggle with it. I think I like the earlier uh, game in the series a bit more, um, Europa Universalis. So here's Robert E. Lee hanging out here in Norfolk, Virginia. He's going to be important to our war operation here. So the game is paused. This is July 1st, 1861, and we are paused right now. And we're just, we're just going to get a sense of what's going on here. So we have a couple of very small starting armies. And there's Richmond, right there, our capital. And Washington is just right around the corner there. So we may be able to do some sneaky stuff. The U.S. doesn't start with very many armies. So if we can just kind of slip somebody in there and take Washington, uh, then that'll, that'll do wonders for our war score. Anyway, let's see what else we're looking at over here. So we have a couple of very small... What is all the battle plans? Oh, they added this in an expansion. I don't know how this works. I'm going to leave this alone. So we start out... The Confederate States of America starts out with a couple of small armies scattered around. And what you got to do is mobilize and start pulling in soldiers as quickly as possible. You'll never outmatch the manpower of the United States. It's not going to happen. So you got to got to get it together elsewhere. So I'm going to increase my military spending, try to make sure that my soldiers are getting all the supplies that I can give them to give myself as much of a fighting chance as possible. Let's see what we can do for technology. All the army stuff has already been researched. The next cutoff is 1870, so we're not going to be, you know, quickly researching machine guns or bolt action rifles in the middle of the Civil War. So that's, uh, that's too bad. I appreciate it, though. It, uh, uh, alternate history can get a little off the rails. Uh, there's a book I thought was was very interesting. It was called The Guns of the South. It was a Harry Turtledove book. And it's about a, a bunch of South African white supremacists in the future who steal a time machine and use it to go back to the middle of the Civil War and equip Robert E. Lee with hundreds of thousands of AK-47s. And that, of course... Uh, alters the outcome of the war, uh, and, uh, and Robert E. Lee ends up becoming president of the Confederacy after that, and realizes what these people did, and, and gets a hold of some history books, and is able to, to see what the future brings, and, and realizes that, uh, 
uh, that the Confederacy can't survive the way it is. And he, and, and, and he actually ends up abolishing slavery and, and, uh, and doing all sorts of civil rights type stuff decades before it actually happened, which, as you can imagine, didn't uh, didn't make him uh, friends with the white supremacists there. And so uh, and so yeah, they ended up with this whole internal conflict and uh, and lots of fights. And it's 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 lots of fun. It's uh, it's it's, uh, it's completely silly. Of course, it's not a realistic book at all. But uh, but Harry Turtle Dove, uh, you don't read Harry Turtle Dove for uh, for for nonfiction and historical accuracy you want a you want a, a fun rip roaring alternate history you pull up harry turtle dove uh, and his good buddy sm sterling also has some excellent uh alternate history type books but we're getting off track here okay here we go the united kingdom we got to be friends with these guys oh they're big they're the number one country so we're going to increase our relations with the UK. We're going to try to get them friendly with us so that they will be more likely to come in and uh, fight on our behalf. So here's the trade menu. It's very, very complicated. But what I need to do is find cotton. There it is. And I need to shut off the automation so that the computer doesn't try to run it for me. And we need to buy up at least 500 units of cotton because there is a special confederacy only event that can trigger if we've got 500 cotton stockpiled that can induce other countries in the world to step in and intervene so let's see here we're still paused what else are we looking at here got a number of generals we have a single navy oh boy not a not much of a navy. Three small, what are these, frigates? Raiders? Frigates. Three small frigates with none of the supplies that they currently need. That's that's not great. Okay. Plenty of generals to work with here. Victoria is kind of fun. Generals get two traits that are randomly assigned and they can be good or they can be bad uh, so if you have a historical general like say Robert E. Lee uh, both of the traits are going to be excellent traits and they're fantastic but later on when you're getting your own generals uh, if you have not developed very much of a uh, of a military yet, much of a, a military tradition, uh, you're probably pulling in generals with traits like alcoholic or you know, afraid of the dark or all, all sorts of just silly things like that. So right now I've got a good set of generals. There's a common misconception uh, among the lost cause writers that the the generals of the of the South were all all excellent and skilled. Uh, men superior in every way to their their northern uh, counterparts, and that all of the uh, the northern generals were all uh, all you know fat and lazy and ineffective. And and if you only look at the eastern campaign, you can see why you would get that sense. There was definitely some incompetency uh, there in the east, but in the west, the opposite was true. The western generals, uh, uh, Sherman and. Grant and Sheridan uh, were just just spectacular right from the beginning and uh, and just tore it all up. So so this so this idea that uh, that the South had great generals and the North had terrible generals was uh, uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, so here's our uh, here's our population breakdown. Victoria gets really deep into the population stuff because you can affect politics and nationalities and it, it, it and, and, and heck if you if you played it in the right way you could probably turn the confederacy into a communist nation in a few years uh, if you if you're good enough at this game oh look at that austin texas is getting a hundred percent of its luxuries how about that that sounds familiar um let's see slaves yes slaves zero people have signed up to be slaves recently well how about that i wonder why hey Six people have stopped being so. So these are all the different population types, and you need these guys to do various things. If you're going to open up a factory, you need to have workers. If you're going to start a war, you need to have soldiers. And so this is all uh, all how you kind of uh, influence your populations to go into varying uh, disciplines. So what we're going to do is set some 
uh, some focuses. We want to try to promote uh, people becoming soldiers in our two most populous states. We can only have uh, two national ideas right now, two, I'm sorry, two national focuses. National ideas is, uh, is from Europa Universalis. Uh, and we want to try to emphasize people becoming soldiers. It's not going to happen fast enough to really have a very big role here, but every little bit helps. Because we are not going to win this war with our own guys. We just need to outlast the Union while we try to get the UK involved. Or maybe France. Or maybe Prussia. Well, probably not Prussia. I don't think they care about what's going on over here. So we've got reforms. We've got various, uh, various things over here. And one of our national decisions in there is the key. That's what I was playing with the cotton for. Okay, let's see. Yes, this is all all standard stuff in here. These reforms start to play a role as your country becomes more and more liberal. Uh, right now, it really doesn't matter. We've got bigger things to worry about. And there it is, King Cotton. Basically, what that is, is we can blockade the cotton industry. We can refuse to let any cotton leave the Confederacy. And what that means is all of the countries that depend on southern cotton, which is quite a few of them, uh, will suddenly start to have major economic problems, especially the UK. And it gives all of those countries causes belly against the United States. It gives them a reason to go to war with the US. Look at that list of countries there. The Russian Empire, Prussia, France, the UK, I mean, obviously, most of these guys are not going to go to war. The Ottomans are not going to go to war with the United States over this, but it greatly increases the likelihood that you'll get somebody to come in on your side. But we need to get some, uh, some cotton first. And we have the nations of Cherokee and Texas that we can release as sovereign nations. I bet they would love that. So we just need to set this thing to buy up as much cotton as possible. It's going to be a big old hit to our economy, but what can you do? I'm not going to go into too much detail about what I'm doing here. Basically, we're just going to pull our guys back as we try to build up our armies uh, and our uh, organization as much as possible. Our armies right now have relatively low organization, and the less organized an army is, the less effective it is. Uh, and we are absolutely going to be outnumbered here. So we will do our best. The longer an army stays in one place, the more it gets dug in. And a dug in army gets various uh, defensive bonuses, which is nice. But uh, let's get back on topic. We're not here to play Victoria and have a deep dive on Victoria because honestly, I am not the person to do that. We are here to talk about the American Civil War. And today, I would like to talk about whether or not one side seemed to have a clear advantage. Now, that might sound like a silly thing to say. At first glance, it would seem that the North had overwhelming advantages in most of the crucial categories. In fact, the North almost certainly would win the conflict is the myth of the lost cause, the writers of which began to publish their work in the 1870s and then continued to publish it through the rest of the century. Uh, and they did argue that the North had an overwhelming advantage, uh, and so the Confederacy never really had a chance to win the war. Uh, the Lost Cause writers said that the admiral thing about the Confederate effort was that they fought so long and so hard against such overwhelming odds that they were so gallant and that they pulled together as a people to such an extent that they held off this massive tide of northern superiority for four long years. And you, find, you can still find many echoes of that argument today. In fact, Shelby Foote uh, has a famous statement. Uh, Shelby Foote is a, is a famous historian of the Civil War. If you ever watch the Ken Burns Civil War series, Shelby Foote is featured in that quite a bit. He's this, this soft-spoken uh, Virginian, and um, I assume he's Virginian. He sounds like a Virginian, but, uh, but he's, he's great. He's, he's got some fantastic stuff there. But he has this famous, famous statement, and he said that the North fought the war 
with one hand tied behind its back, and if things had become more grim for the North, the North would have just pulled that other hand out from behind its back and prosecuted the war to victory. And Foote says that in effect the Confederacy never had a chance to win the war, and I'm saying that that's not the case. The Confederacy did have a chance to win the war, and in fact I think it came close to doing so on more than one occasion. And what I would like to do now is look at some of the factors that would contribute toward one side's winning or losing the war. Just a second here. So we are combining our army units right here. We're going to put together the Army of Northern Virginia, and I don't see a lot of U.S. forces to the north. I think we have a chance to make a run at Washington. If you can occupy the other country's capital, uh, that's, a, that's a massive set of, of war points. And I don't need as many war points to win as the United States does. So we might have an opportunity here. Anyway, let's look at categories in which one side had a distinct advantage over the other. First, let's look at the North, and then we'll look at the Confederacy, and we're going to start with population as a crucial Northern advantage here. There's no question about it. The United States, the North, had a clear edge when it came to manpower. The 1860 census put the U.S. population at about 31 million people. Uh, of, those 11, uh, of those, the 11 states of the Confederacy uh, had about 9 million people, uh, and uh, of those 9, about 5.5 million were white, 3.5 were African American slaves, and another 130,000 or so were free blacks living in the Confederate states. Now, about 600,000 white people in the states remaining loyal to the Union cast their lot with the Confederacy, so they bailed out. So that brought the total white population in, popu uh, in support of the Confederacy to around 6 million. And by the way, these numbers are all very rough. Uh, historians have debated them uh, forward and back, and I'm not a historian, so I'm not pretending that we can be precise here, but roughly six million white people supported the Confederacy. The North's population was about 22 million, less the 600,000 sympathizers for about 21 million uh, people that the North could draw on. There were a significant numbers of Northern sympathizers in Western Virginia, however, and in Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina and the uplands of Alabama and the hill country of Texas and of Arkansas. Every state in the Confederacy had sections of pro-unionist, anti-Confederate sentiment, often in the mountain or hill country sections of the state. So the North had about a five to two advantage in manpower over the Confederacy. Two, two and a half to one, 2.5 to one, if you want to put it another way, advantage over the Confederacy. And during the course of the war, between 2.1 and 2.2 million men served in the United States military, just about half of the military age population of the North. One in two Northern men. Oh gosh, so these guys already have 2% victory on me. Yeah, this is, this is going to be a hard one to win here. All right, I'm getting off track here. Uh, so, one in two northern men, in other words, of military age, went into the service. The Confederacy mustered between 750 and 850,000 men, uh, of its roughly one million military age white males. So that's pretty darn good. The Confederate figures are much less reliable than the figures of the North, but it's still an astonishing rate of mobilization. Roughly 80% of their military age white males went into the army. That's a very impressive feat, made possible really only by the presence of slave laborers behind the lines. But in the area of population potential, soldiers, the uh, population potential soldiers, the North had a huge advantage. No way around it. 2.5 to 1. Okay, so what about economic strength? Well, here again, the North is overwhelmingly more powerful by almost any yardstick. The North enjoyed a huge advantage in this area. There are any number of ways you can get at this using different kinds of figures. I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers, but let me just throw out a few for your consideration. Here, there were 110,000 manufacturing establishments in the North that employed about 1.3 million workers. 
In the Confederacy, there were 18,000 manufacturing establishments that employed about 110,000 workers. So the easiest way to think about that is there were as many manufacturing establishments in the North as there were individual factory workers in the South. It's an enormous edge to the North. Northern railroads, far more extensive, nearly 22,000 miles uh, and only a shade more than 9,000 miles in the Confederacy. Uh, and the Northern railroads tended to be better, better built. Uh, and beyond that, the North had the capacity to, to replace worn out rails and add new rolling stock. The Confederacy did not. So as the war goes along, Northern railroads get stronger Confederate railroads become more and more decrepit. Okay, so my plan is looking okay so far. We've got the Army of Northern Virginia in Washington. We're going to try to complete that siege. We've got an army coming into Roanoke, Virginia. And we're starting to link up our guys down here. What I'm expecting is the U.S. Army is going to come rolling across the border and start taking sections, but usually I can recapture them faster than they can, uh, faster than they can initially grab them, and then I can um, uh, just outcap them. So I've just got to escape when they come after me there. So that'll be the idea as I continue to befriend uh, the UK. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, where were we? Uh, so according to the 1860 census, the North was at an enormous advantage in several key categories. The North had 11 times as many ships as the Confederacy had. They had 15 times as much iron production, 17 times as much textile goods, 24 times as many locomotives, more than 30 times as many firearms, and on and on and so on. Northern manufacturing was colossal compared to the rather modest level of manufacturing in the Confederacy. There were roughly 800,000 draft animals in the North and about 300,000 in the South. And again, we have to remember that mid-19th century armies moved by horse and mule power. That's how you, how you get all the supplies. That's how you pulled the cannon. That's how you move the cavalry. And the North had a huge advantage in this area. Okay. I don't know where that guy came from, but that is a big enough army to really cause some trouble. Okay, and Roanoke has been occupied. Oh, shoot, he's going for Richmond. Okay, we got to get in there, try to get dug in, defend the capital. Oh, this, this is not good. Oh, gosh, they have no supplies. They're organized, but they've got no supplies, so this is going to be messy. This, oh, no. So those little numbers floating up overhead are telling you what the uh, what the damage looks like. Let's see. Oh God, it's William Tecumseh Sherman. Okay, he's he's got some attacking penalties, but he's got some very nice advantages as well. Oh boy, he's got way more infantry than me, way more artillery. Oh, this is we're gonna lose Richmond. Hmm. Should we pull these guys out? The siege is going well. I don't think we can afford to just keep sitting on Washington there. Ah, oh, what a mess. This is already coming apart. Oh, shoot. All right, and here comes the Department of the West starting to swoop in here. So we got to... Got to keep an eye on where those guys are and then slip in behind them. Now, let's see here. We can mess with Joplin a little bit. We recruited a couple of guys here in Texas, so there's a Houston division, uh, one in Dallas. I think we're going to play a little behind enemy lines stuff here. Going to use Vicksburg as our uh, as our rally area. Let's see what's going on here. So the Chattanooga, Tennant, Knoxville, Knoxville. I think we can. I think we can do some good damage there. I need Knoxville. That's a big coal producing area. Okay, I think let's set let's set a rally point out here. I've I've queued up a number of guys to recruit and I want them to all kind of go to the same place here. So we'll set 
We'll set Columbia here as a rally point. And how are we doing? Okay, we're going to see if we can get Memphis back. Looks like we got some ships out there. Okay, the attack on Richmond is still going, but I don't see a lot of green in there. Oh, no. Oh, shoot. There was no... There was no general in that army. I'm sure... I'm sure I had Jeb Stewart on that army. What happened there? Maybe he was killed in the fight. All right, we got to pull these guys out of Washington. Oh, I was so close. I almost had Washington. The siege is going well, but oh, we can't lose Richmond. Fine. Okay, where were we? Uh, so we're, we're still comparing the North and the South. Uh, so let's look at the United States Army and the United States Navy at the beginning of the war. So the North starts the war with a regular army and a regular navy. And the Confederacy starts the war with neither. It has to build that from scratch. And we have to count this as a plus for the North, but I think it's not as large a plus as it might seem to be because the United States Army was tiny. In 1861, between uh, 15 and 16,000 men. And in the spring of 1861, after many, many Southerners had left the U.S. Army, it was down to around 14,000. And more of that, uh, more than that, it was spread out across the continent, much of it on duty out in the far west. So there isn't the United States Army present in any one place and able to march against the Confederacy. It's a very, very small organization, and it's scattered across a gigantic landscape, much of it west of the Mississippi River. So that's the Army. What about the Navy? The U.S. Navy had only 90 vessels in 1861. It had 90 vessels, 42 of which were in commission. And most of those 42 were patrolling waters far from the coastal areas and rivers of the South, so uh, where they would be needed during the Civil War. So it's a small Navy, and it's a very, very widely dispersed Navy. Uh, in the spring of 1861, only three ships were available for immediate service against the Confederate States. Three ships, that's not enough to make much of a difference. Uh, moreover, the United States Navy was a deep water Navy with little expertise in the type of coastal and inshore operations that would characterize the Civil War. This is, for the most part, going to be a naval war fought along the coastlines and on the Mississippi River and the other great rivers that lead into the Confederacy. And the United States Navy of 1861 is not a Navy constructed to wage that kind of war. So place the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy on the side of Union strengths at the outset of the war, but put a little asterisk beside them because it's not as important a strength as it might at first appear to be. Oh, this is not going well at all. All right, time for a little, little bleeding Kansas. We've got Topeka under siege. And oh boy, they they're getting our far north states up there. Okay, we've got a we've got a navy. Let's let's send them out. One of the DLCs added a lot of the Civil War music and it's very pretty. Oh, here we go. Okay, we've got some steamers. Those are transport ships and a couple of frigates. I have a couple of frigates. I think I can do something about that. Okay, so I just explained to you the northern advantages. Clear categories in which the north has an advantage. But what about the Confederacy? It also has clear advantages, although they don't seem as obvious in some ways as the northern ones. I think perhaps the greatest Confederate plus lay in the area of war aims or their conditions for victory. The South had only to defend itself to achieve independence. In fact, it could do nothing. And if the United States didn't do anything, the Confederacy would win by default. The North, in contrast, had to invade the South, destroy its war-making capacity, or at least the will to win or to resist on the part of the Southern people. It would take a protracted major effort for the United States to accomplish that. A much different goal for the North than the goal for the Confederacy going into the war to achieve their respective objects. 
If the South could just prolong the war long enough to convince a majority of the Northern people that it was too expensive in lives or too expensive in treasure to continue, they would win the war. A tie was as good as a win for the Confederacy if they could just hold off the North until the North said, that's enough. The Confederacy would win. The North did not have that luxury. The Confederacy, in other words, you didn't have to send its armies into the North. They didn't have to try to capture those Northern cities. They didn't have to try to destroy the war-making capacity of the United States in order to win. The North did have to do all of those things to, con uh, to defeat the Confederacy. And there was a tremendous example readily at hand to bolster Confederate expectations and will. They had to look no further than the experience of the colonies during the American Revolution to see a weaker party that had won in a war against a much stronger party by dragging the war out. Speaking of which, look at this. War between the United Kingdom and the USA. That's exactly what I was going for. The UK has joined the war and in this case, at this time, that means Canada. So the United States now has a war on two fronts. If I can just stay alive, but my major armies are gone, this might be too little too late. Oh boy. Okay, so the colonies, the American Revolution. That's all you had to look at in order to see a, a, a weaker party that had won in a war against a much stronger party by dragging the war out, by convincing the more powerful party that its interests lay elsewhere, and it was simply too expensive to continue that war. That's how the United States had achieved independence. The people in both the North and the South were well aware of that. Now, closely tied to the fact that the Confederacy enjoyed an edge in this respect and what it had to do to win was the fact that a defending force almost always enjoys an advantage over an invading force. An advantage in morale. Men tend to fight harder to defend their homes than they do to try to impose their will on others who are defending their homes. And observers on both sides were well aware of this. The defender often enjoys higher morale. Soldiers on both sides commented about this phenomenon during the war. Confederate soldiers in Maryland and Pennsylvania during Lee's invasions of 62-63 that we talked about in the other video, they said they noticed a different attitude within their ranks about carrying the war to the enemy as opposed to defending home and hearth. And northern soldiers defending southern Pennsylvania talked about how it seemed more important all of a sudden to do well because they were defending their homes rather than carrying the war to the confederates so it is an advantage to be defending hearth and home it's also an advantage to be fighting the war on your home ground for a number of reasons one is that you're likely to have a better understanding of the topography how the rivers flow where the roads are where the gaps in the mountains are if you don't know those things the likelihood is high that a friendly population will tell you those things when they will not tell the invasion army those things. There are innumerable examples of civilians helping out a Confederate army in this regard. Uh, during the course of the war, an obvious one coming at the Battle of Chancellorsville, which you'll remember from Level 1. Early May 1863, when on the night of May 1st, Lee and Stonewall Jackson were trying to figure out a way to get around Joseph Hooker's right flank without being detected. And local people came forward and said, we know back roads that will take you around to the position you want to be. And during the night, those guides showed staff officers how to get there. And then the next day, Jackson made his famous flanking march, and that showed the advantage of being on your home ground and having friendly people show you how to get to where you want to go to achieve your military ends. Well, this battle is not going well at all. My goodness gracious, we're just losing. The oh, and it looks like our budget has completely collapsed here. I don't think we're going to manage to finish our research. Hmm. Oh dear. Okay, so by fighting on the defensive on their home ground, the Confederates also in many instances enjoy 
the close uh, enjoy the advantage of what were called interior lines in military parlance. That uh, meant simply that they were often with their different forces closer to one another and better able to reinforce one another than the advancing Federals who might be coming at them on a more widely dispersed outline of advance. As a perfect example of that, very early in the war during the campaign, a, uh, the, uh, the Battle of First Manassas or Bull Run, when each side has two armies, each side has an army near Washington and each side has an army in the lower Shenandoah Valley. That is the, the northern end of the Shenandoah Valley. The, uh, the Confederates have a railroad that links their two forces. They have an advantage of interior lines there that the Union does not enjoy. And they use those interior lines to reinforce their army near Washington with their army in the lower Shenandoah Valley and to win a victory in, uh, in July of 1861. Another plus that uh, cannot be, uh, I'm sorry, another plus that has to be placed on the side of the Confederacy, uh, one of the largest factors favoring the Confederacy involved geography. Now, this one really, I think, cannot be overstated. The geography of the South constituted an overall military advantage that greatly impressed people at the time. Trained military men on both sides, as well as civilians, who had at least a rough grasp of what it would take for one side or the other to win, the Confederate States of America was a huge nation, more than three quarters of a million square miles to the Confederacy, equal in size to modern-day France, West Germany, Italy, Spain, and other pieces of Western Europe. Oh, they don't call it West Germany anymore, do they? Well, never mind. So let's just look at some of the geographic features uh, beyond this, uh, this the size of the Confederacy that we need to keep in mind. Let's start with the coastline. Confederate coastline ran for approximately 3,500 miles. It is enormous. And in that 3,500 miles were nearly 200 rivers. Uh, in the uh, river uh, inlets, basins, other places where vessels could move in and out, vessels to bring goods into the Confederacy, vessels to take goods out of the Confederacy, the blockade runners. Uh, it would be very difficult for the North to blockade that huge coastline. And of course, blockade it is what they sought to do from the very beginning of the war. Uh, they never really succeeded in sealing off the Confederate coast, although they became much better at it as the, uh, as the war went on, as the Navy grew. The Appalachian Mountains were a daunting barrier that frustrated the Federals from, the, from uh, shifting effectively strength from east to west or west to east, at least until uh, William Tecumseh Sherman moved into Georgia in 1864, uh, the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia formed a protected corridor uh, the Confederate forces used repeatedly. Confederate forces could, uh, could move across the Blue Ridge into the Shenandoah Valley, and they could march northward down the valley, cross the Potomac River, sheltering themselves in the gaps of the Blue Ridge to their east, and find themselves across the Potomac to the right rear of Washington, in the rear of Washington City in a position to menace uh, the United States Capitol. In contrast, northern forces marching into the Shenandoah Valley in marching up the valley found themselves getting further and further away from the Confederate capital of Richmond and from key military points in the eastern part of the state. So the Shenandoah Valley worked very nicely for the Confederates as a military avenue of advance. Oh boy. Guys, I don't think I'm going to be able to... Uh, to bring the Confederacy to independence on this one. We are we are down to nothing here. Can try to make a last stand in the far west here, El Paso, Texas. I don't know if that's gonna work. Okay, so final point here. We should never forget the importance of the Union troops trying to come to grips with a poor transportation network. I'm talking about the roads and the rails and things like that in an enormous country. A factor made all the worse when bad weather combined with the poor nature of the roads. There are only a handful of roads in the Confederacy, as good as the Valley Pike and the Shenandoah Valley, for example, which was an all-weather road. Uh, it was a macadamized road, that is. Uh, crushed stone graded with, uh, with tar on each side so that it would uh, drain to a degree. Uh, it, could, uh, it could stand rain and still have heavy use. Most of the roads in the south could not. They became muddy tracks very quickly and almost impassable in, uh, in poor weather. There's a document 
in the official records of the War of the Rebellion from a Union officer with a sense of humor. Uh, he put in a request through the channels. Uh, he was taking part in a winter campaign, and he said that he would like 50 men 25 feet tall to work in mud 18 feet deep. And that's the nature of Southern Roads. Ambrose Burnside's frustrating mud march in, uh, in March of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mud march in January of 1863 was an excellent example of, of bad roads and the weather conspiring to stop a northern offensive. So just keep this in mind when you try to, uh, to judge just how daunting were the obstacles facing the North. Overall, a geography uh, favored the Confederacy. And, uh, and just to summarize, the size of the South, the coastline, and the nature of the transportation infrastructure, only the rivers might be reckoned at least a partial Union advantage. So let's leave this part of our reckoning of pluses and minuses on each side uh, with a firm understanding that both sides enjoyed the advantage in some categories. It's not just the case of the overwhelmingly more powerful North getting ready to work its will on the Confederacy. Each side had some advantages. So let's see what we can salvage. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, they got me. Once they get a 100% war score, uh, they annex me. Uh, and that's that's it. Huh, so I went from the number 10 most powerful nation in the world to the um, hmm, a bit less than that. And then all these are, are uh, empty because I'm, I'm annexed. Uh, can't get population information on a country that doesn't exist anymore. Well, that went about as well as most of my Victoria games go, but uh, but it's still it's still a great game. So it's a very very fun game. Um, I also grabbed a hold of eight uh, eight Agiods Agiods Civil War Two, uh, which is a grand strategy game like this. And my goodness, is that a difficult game to play? I don't know if I'm going to do any of that. It's uh, it's not cooperating with my desktop resolution very well uh, but anyway there you go that's a grand strategy game that uh, that covers the civil war and i and i hope i uh, I, I cleared up some things for you here about the starting position uh, of the war. It really wasn't as simple as some people make it out to be. So uh, this was uh, this was another of the intermission videos. Uh, if this is uh, if this is something that you're into, let me know. Uh, if you want some more shoot 'em up uh, type videos, let me know that as well. And uh, and uh, we'll just uh, we'll just keep generating quality content. How about so? Until next time, see you around, everybody. <laughs>